thank you so much, everybody, for coming along to this session. And uh, Stephen has uh, broken the record officially now with the most number of bookings for an Excelia Vet Community Professional Development session. So uh, congratulations, Stephen. And the session today is on a vet, vet practitioner interpretation of competencies. As you can see on my screen there, I've got the lovely seasonal themed Excelia intro screen. And uh, shortly, I'll do an introduction to our very, very special guest today, Associate Professor, Professor Stephen Hodge. Before that, Excelia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants that are here with us today. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spirit, imagination, and rich history of teaching and learning that's been happening on this land for many thousands of years. So our very special guest today is Associate Professor Stephen Hodge. Uh, Professor Hodge is, from, uh, he's a, he's a member of the Griffith Institute for Educational Research in the School of Education and Professional Studies at Griffith University. And uh, he's the director of the Masters of Education and the Grad Cert and Professional Learning Programs there at Griffith University. He's immediate past president of the Australasian Vocational Education and Training Association, that's a vetra. He's a key contributor to debate in Australian post compulsory education. He's on the editorial team for the International Journal of Lifelong Education and the International Journal of Training Research. He's a member of the Australian Council of Deans of Education, uh, the Vocational Education Group. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Stephen on a few projects over the last few years. And I've very much enjoyed having, uh, when we get time, having some really interesting conversations about the world of vocational education. And um, while Professor Hodge spends a lot of time researching this very area, uh, Stephen's background goes back to working in RTO, so he very much has that experience, like many of us in the session today, where uh, you know he's he's really worked with learners in RTO, so he really knows what it's like out there um, in in the world of of vet. So, on that note, I'll hand it over to Stephen to uh, get the slides ready, and we'll uh, kick off the session today. Um, just just before we start, sorry, one thing I forgot is uh, yes, we can provide you with a copy of today's slides and there'll be a recording for the session. You'll get a certificate that uh, acknowledges you've attended if you do attend the session. And uh, I was chatting to Stephen before the session and he, he tells me that, uh, that there is a, a lot of really valuable content in here and it, it probably will take up the whole hour today. Um, and we, we do have uh, some we probably will have some Q&A. So if we do get to the Q&A session, it may actually spill into past the hour. So if you do need to leave, that's fine. We do understand that. And we would thank you for sticking around. Um, because of the numbers uh, in today's session, the number of bookings, I have enabled the Q&A system uh, because I do find the chat gets a little bit out of control, <laughs> a bit hard to keep track of. So I'll be, I'll be fielding the, the chat and any questions to Stephen when we get to that. So I'll uh, stop my sharing now and I'll let Stephen get, uh, get that all sorted out on his side. Thank you. Now, Paul, can I just confirm that you've got the, the starting page there with a the big Griffith logo? Absolutely. Yeah, th thank you very much. And thank you so much for that introduction, Paul. I'm so glad that I don't have to rattle off uh, all of those bits and bobs uh, about my roles and things. Um, I uh, uh, will, will today um, share some research that I conducted a while ago on how trainers interpret competencies. Um, although the, the bulk of the data that I present is about 10 years old, what's important about it is that the issues that it um, highlights, the the, the topics that it raises have not gone away. Indeed, they're more um, they're more relevant than ever. Uh, also, this is research that I've come back and back and back to and built on. 
um, just because it is so very important, uh, it seems to me. So while I research uh, all sorts of different aspects of um, Australian VET and international VET, this theme of how trainers work with units of competency has been a, a kind of a favourite theme of mine uh, for a while. I would like to um, also um, uh, acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Yuggerable, Yuggera, Jagera, and Turbal peoples, and would also like to extend my respects to elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And this beautiful artwork shows the Brisbane River and that, that little circle down the bottom there is the Mount Gravatt uh, campus where I work uh, and where I live and um, um, or I live nearby. So that, that's why I mentioned those four, four Aboriginal peoples. Um, now, just in terms of a, a very broad session outline, there, there's some background to, to cover off just to give context to the, to the research and to some of the debates. I'll provide a detailed introduction to the 2014 research that I do, did on how trainers interpret units of competency, and then spend time looking at some subsequent work I've done and also some of the implications of that, that earlier research. Just by way of background, Paul mentioned that uh, I, I am experienced in the vet sector. I spent um, many um, interesting and sometimes challenging years working in private and public providers. Um, uh, very often the work I was doing was in relation to the TAA and TAE or BSZ um, as well as it was, was originally. So I, I did my um, certificate for an assessment and workplace training in about 2000, I think it was, and then stayed in the sector um, and, uh, you know, obviously refreshed my, my cert four qualifications over time and, and, and spent a lot of time um, um, uh, delivering that, that program, but also developing resources for that program and then managing um, delivery uh, in, in private uh, providers. Um, so uh, I, I've been up close to the to the uh, the challenges and rewards of working closely with training packages. Uh, so that that's just a, a, a little bit more um, background for you there. Um, continuing on the theme of background, I'd just like to get us all onto the same page um, before we start talking about that two thousand and fourteen study. And I, I do so by, by proposing a thing that we can call the theory of the VET system. So the, the theory of the VET system is, or this is perhaps one of the theories of the VET system, but the theory of the VET system as we're putting it here is that there's a, a kind of flow of information where industry understands its own skill needs they are reflected and specified in the form of competencies. Vet practitioners, and so they can be vet leaders, resource developers, trainers, assessors, interpret and implement the competencies. Learners develop the skills specified in the competencies and industry finally gets the skills it needs. So it's a, it's a neat little logic that sits behind our vet system. And uh, it, it's, it's one of the, the, the features of Australian VET that is, um, that, that is admired in other countries. So, so th this kind of really systematic approach we have to developing learners who are competent in current industry skill needs is the envy of the international community. The research I, I did in 2014 happened to pick out this, this middle section, the interpretation and implementation by vet, vet practitioners. Vet practitioners understood broadly, and they, they can be managers of RTOs, they can be resource developers, they can be trainers, teachers, assessors, um, workplace facilitators, and so on. So 
there are a lot of people in the VET system who need to work with units of competency for various reasons. At the time, in 2014, the core unit in the Certificate 4 that related to the interpretation and implementation of units of competency was the TAE DES 402A, use training packages and accredited courses to meet client needs. Of course, that has been superseded. If we look at some of the, some of the elements, performance criteria, et cetera, of, of that earlier unit, that there are quite clear expectations about what, um, what graduates of this unit of competency of the certificate for more broadly will, will be competent in. They'll be competent in analyzing and interpreting units of competency. They'll be able to read, analyze and interpret all parts of the unit. They, under the required knowledge, they would develop a methodology relating to analyzing and using competency standards. And I note that in the current unit, the use nationally recognized training products to meet vocational training needs. A lot of these words and ideas are identical. Um, there, there, there are some changes, but the intent is still there that a person who does TAE DES 411 will be able to do these sorts of things. They'll be able to read a unit of competency with, with understanding and comprehension and insight. And they'll be able to use that understanding they develop to, to develop resources, to plan training and assessment, and to deliver um, the competencies as such. And not only that, they'll have a fairly sophisticated methodology for doing so. They'll be able to um, approach this problem in different ways, depending on different, different employers they may be working with, different students, uh, and we're perhaps working in different providers and perhaps also with different resources. So when we talk about a methodology here, and that's still in the current uh, unit, that we're talking about something quite sophisticated, a, a, a set of abilities that, that interact and are activated by the need to read the content of a training package. Now, it was knowing this content the content of this particular unit of competency that, that kind of uh, inspired me to approach the National Centre for Vocational Education um, Research, the NCBER, to, um, to, to support research into this. And they, they funded my application. Um, they appreciated that this is an area that, well, had never been researched um, that hopefully works just fine and you almost don't have to research it, but it wouldn't be a bad thing to sort of just confirm that what's written in this unit of competency is what's happening out there. Uh, at the time, I was, uh, I, I think, maybe a little bit naive about what was happening uh, in the world of trainers and assessors. And I thought, well, you know, our system is so strict about compliance with what is recorded in units of competency that no doubt, if I research what's happening out there, I'll discover exactly what's written here in front of you, that people will be analyzing, analyzing and interpreting. They'll be reading, analyzing, and interpreting all parts of the unit, and they'll have a sophisticated methodology for doing so. So I really thought that was exactly what I'd find and I'd be able to move on and research other parts of it, but it, it didn't quite work out that way. There's some literature that I tapped into, first of all, in putting this research together. Um, and this is what we always do with our research projects. We, we, we read up on as much of the relevant research and other kinds of literature policy um, procedures, et cetera, that relate to our research. And when I was doing that research, uh, that reading, I should say, uh, I discovered that there was quite a solid literature on how educators of various kinds, so vet educators, but also school teachers, um, higher education 
um, lecturers, all these, all these educational roles have been researched in terms of how, how individuals read. It could be called curriculum or it could be something like um, uh, professional standards and translate these into learning. Um, a few of the dot points here um, just pick up on key contributions to this literature. Beyond Blue in 2009, which had um, funded a large program for professional development of counsellors and other people involved in addressing uh, depression. Um, once they implemented their program and then ran an evaluation, discovered that the delivery of that program was quite different to what they'd intended. Um, people in the program certainly received uh, outcomes, valuable outcomes in many ways, but that there was still a discrepancy between the intended outcomes and the actual outcomes. In the school teacher literature, there's a long tradition of looking at how what they call teacher-proof curriculum is um, implemented. And there again, there's um, a lot of data that says teachers, they sometimes misunderstand the curriculum, or sometimes they engage in what is called creative insubordination. They don't agree with the teacher-proof curriculum, so they implement something they think is better for their students or this school or this community. Closer to home, there had been different projects on how vet practitioners work with training packages. So John Mitchell, Bill and Clayton, and others had done a little bit of research here. And one of the, um, the one of the interesting things was that there was a bit of a problem when it came to training packages that people um, people in these studies didn't necessarily feel that they had enough practice unpacking training packages or they weren't confident with using training packages. So that's when I was starting to read up uh, it, um, to, to develop up my project, I could see that there are actually quite a few questions that, that were um, coming up from the literature uh, and that uh, in turn informed the kinds of questions and the kind of uh, interviews I was having with the, the trainers later. There's also, uh, when one is putting together a research project, um, we, we consider the theories that relate to, to a project area. And I found a whole cluster of theories, right, that talk to, in various ways, what happens when people take something like, it could be a unit of competency, but it could also be a curriculum, it could be a policy, it could be directions of various kinds, and implement them. So curriculum theory, um, such as uh, studied by my colleague Stephen Billett, uh, curriculum theory often finds there's slippage between intended and what they call enacted curriculum. Theory of interpretation, which we'll come back to if we have time, um, tells us that the process of reading any authoritative text is incredibly complex and especially uh, becomes problematic when there's, a, when there's a gap between those reading and implementing and on the other hand, the people who are writing directions, texts of various kinds. Theory of expertise gives us another angle. Uh, many people will be aware of the Dreyfus and Dreyfus model of um, expertise development. One of the things that that model tells us about experts is that you can have an expert who's not terribly good at unpacking why they are an expert, especially if you place an expert in front of a group of beginners. Potentially, this expert won't make sense to the beginners. And that's because there is a gap between understanding the experiences of someone just entering an area of expertise and being an expert. And that gap actually relates to what we're talking about because the a unit of competence delivered by an expert sets up an interesting situation where the expert may not recognize what's written in a unit of competency as something that relates to their area of expertise. Communication theory is another area 
um, the, it, it's kind of fallen out of fashion. And you can see the reference there is really quite old. But in communication theory, there is it's a, it's a standard um, part of that theory that there is a, always a discrepancy between the sent and the received messages. And that's because there's always some degree of noise in systems. And finally, um, there's, a, there's a powerful body of work um, that's been undertaken by Lisa Wheelerhan and others that says, you know, competencies as we, as we conceptualize them and write them in Australian VET actually cannot describe the full range of required knowledge and skills for a given occupation, especially the knowledge side of it. So um, Lisa Wheelerhan's work um, and does a great job of shining a light on the kinds of knowledge required in, in higher level occupations that are missed by the way our units of competency are designed. Our units of competency are designed um, to do a good job of um, tasks that we can see performed. But as soon as competent performance involves a lot of thinking or a lot of perhaps critical thinking, problem solving, using higher order knowledge, well, we can't kind of see that in that direct way that other kinds of skills can be seen. And therefore, our units of competency are, are, are not designed in a way to pick up those more sophisticated determinants of occupational um, expertise. That, that's, that, that's an argument, we, we, we won't go into that now, but, but that is what comes out of some research that's of relevance here. Just in terms of my little project, uh, the goal was to learn about how VET practitioners understand and use competencies. Um, the rationale was that this is really, really important for the system uh, because you saw from the theory of VET that you need um, trainers, teachers, assessors, facilitators to be really understanding what's in units of competency and translating them in, in a solid and interesting way into learning. The, in terms of the process, it was a small project. It was a qualitative project. I recruited 30 practitioners from a range of industry backgrounds and with a range of levels of experience in VET. And they were interviewed about their understanding and use of competencies. And this is a little bit on the participants. I was based in Victoria at the time. And there you can see a, a, a little bit of a breakdown uh, of um, the demographics there, the bulk of metropolitan, that's not a surprise. Uh, 21 for, for, were from public providers. That, that's not a representative kind of balance. I prefer, prefer that perhaps be the other way around, especially in Victoria. Um, uh, 16 of the 30 had the CERT for as their higher, highest practitioner qualification, so their highest um, training and education qualification. And across the, the, the trainers that I spoke with, we're talking about 17 training packages uh, were represented across eight as they used to be called industry skill councils. Now, I asked uh, a series of questions that kind of organically followed the experience that we, that we all have when we learn about competencies. So some of the questions were about how did you learn about competencies? What kind of challenges, what kinds of insights did you gain through that process? Generally, we're talking about a person undertaking their cert for. Well, what was interesting that was that nine out of the 30 participants had already been involved in reading and interpreting competencies before they stepped into a cert for um, situation in the first place. So it's kind of interesting. You've got a lot of staff in RTOs who are who know what competencies are, who do something uh, with competencies, but then they, they don't actually have the, the cert for. So th that was a bit of a surprise. It was a surprise to um, uh, senior people who are reading and monitoring this research. Now, in terms of the formal training, the overall message from the um, 30 trainers was that insufficient time was devoted to the skills of interpretation and 
that by the time people were signed off as competent in that unit that, that I showed you before, they still had difficulties understanding competencies. The bulk of the participants in my research said it took them about a year to feel competent, confident reading and interpreting and in implementing units of competency. So that, that that's kind of, that, that's, a, that, that's really quite an interesting figure when you consider that most of these people had already been signed off as, as competent in that unpacking uh, uh, training packages uh, unit. Um, so they were competent, but they actually took another year or so, sometimes longer, to feel okay with it. Formal PD was, was offered and it was seen to be valuable, but many participants had very limited access to this kind of PD. So that, th this is an interesting point for perhaps uh, future uh, workshops, Paul or uh, VELG or any of those um, PD providers, it, it's, it might be worthwhile to consider uh, uh, boosting the level of PD offered on unpacking units of competence. Uh, competency. Um, one of the interesting things that came out, and everyone knows this, and, and when I when I when I was listening to people talking about their experiences, I, I realized that this applied to me too. That assessment validation processes served as a powerful informal professional development process in terms of understanding units of competency. So as soon as assessors individually or in groups had to start arguing about what makes a good assessment uh, tool and, and process in relation to particular units of competency. That's where people were forced to go back to the documents and to interrogate their understanding. So that was interesting and also something I'm sure uh, everyone uh, in this session understands and has, has experienced. Um, some of the best arguments described to me were in this setting. And just, um, I, I really like this um, Certificate for Trainer who, who, by the time I interviewed her, she was a Certificate for Trainer, but she was talking about her first experience of the Certificate for, um, and, and it's, uh, I, I just, I'm, um, I, I won't include a lot of long quotes, but I like, like this one. Uh, I remember my first ever course, I was completely confused. And luckily my same sister-in-law, well, she came along with me because she was curious. I just thought, thank God, because I remember that the trainer, I just felt like she was speaking in hieroglyphics. I kept looking over to my sister-in-law saying, what is she talking about? My sister-in-law would pass me little post-it notes under the table saying, well, there's three sections of this and she's talking about the first section. Ha, huh, okay, thank you. So it, in, in other words, understanding competency standards certainly did not happen in my first course. And this is from an accomplished certificate for trainer. When we talk about ongoing learning, so, so moving on to questions about how they've continued to develop their understanding of units of competency, that, um, uh, and, and this relates to a, a previous slide there, PD on unpacking training packages was valuable, but rarely accessed. There's, uh, across the sector, there's, uh, <laughs> That there, there are always difficulties accessing enough PD for the complexity of the work that we're doing. Um, so it was no surprise that there was also difficulty and sometimes uh, no time or no resources to access PD on unpacking training packages. Um, as we mentioned before, assessment validation process was probably the most valuable. And upgrading the certificate for did not necessarily improve interpretation skills. So th that, that's an interesting one for all of us involved in the processes of bringing people uh, 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 up to speed with new versions of the Cert 4, that it, it is worth double checking how a person is, is interpreting, uh, is reading, interpreting, analyzing uh, units of competency. This kind of shocked me. I did, I, I, I had some questions in the interview schedule about how people, how would you describe the language 
of competency. So you, 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 you open a training package, you find your unit of competency, and you start reading it. What do you think about the language that you find there? And all but three of the participants had something a bit negative to say about the language of units of competency. So um, some of the words were fluffy, ambiguous, fuzzy, vague, jargonized, convoluted, not well written, poorly written, written just appallingly. So um, that, that was a bit of a shock to me to hear people talking like this about units of competency. The theory and the kind of the thinking of the system is that units of competency are incredibly transparent representations of occupational skills. They're supposed to be read by trainers, but they're supposed to be also accessible to students, to employers, to parents, to a wide range of stakeholders. The whole idea was that units of competency would always be a highly accessible way to understand what's going to go on in a diploma, a Cert 3, a Cert 4, et cetera. So the fact that trainers were talking about the language like this was uh, a little bit surprising to me. And here's, uh, I said there wouldn't be too many long quotes and there aren't, but uh, th this one's an interesting one. I'd asked this management trainer about uh, the language and they, they had quite a lot to say. And this is just a quote, I'm laughing. They were laughing, right? So I'm laughing because in the advanced diploma area, when I was working at a small RTA with two other trainers, they named that, who were both trainers doing the same work as, as what I was, we'd often question this, the language of the competencies, and say, well, what a load of rubbish. Why don't people talk in a language that a person studying gets it? It's almost like it's been written for an academic environment rather than the level that it's pitched at. The per there, there were questions in my research also about the purpose of competencies. Again, a little bit surprising the, the range of perspectives people uh, expressed in the interviews. The purpose was to describe job roles, which is actually quite right. They specify ideal levels of performance, okay? Others said they specify minimum levels of performance. Others said they specify training and assessment activities or that they describe personal abilities or that they're designed to promote consistency and vet. One of the 30 qualified trainers I spoke with couldn't say what the purpose of the competencies were. Now, many of the, the points here are are uh, simultaneously true of units of competency. So that's not a problem. Uh, but what is, what, what, one, of, one of the uh, points that comes from this that, that is, is to me quite striking is the fact that you've got some people saying competencies specify an ideal of performance and others say it specifies a minimum of performance. Now, um, I don't know what you can say about the truth of each, but the fact that there is that kind of range is really, really interesting because if a trainer thinks that a unit of competency specifies an ideal, that will affect how they interpret and implement the competency. And you think about it, if, they, if, they, if their view is that it specifies a minimum level, that has to have an impact on how they are implementing that competency. There were questions about the meaning of elements. So if, if you recall the details of the unit of competency relating to unpacking training packages, there, there, there is the expectation that a, that a competent graduate of that unit or the set for as a whole will be able to, that, that they will know what each part of a unit of competency is. So I was interested to ask, from your view, what is an element? What is a performance criteria? How do these things work together? So we went through the, the parts of the units of competency. Now, of course, the, the format has changed slightly through the streamlining process that was undertaken a few years back, but we still have elements and elements 
describe the essential outcomes. And um, most of the um, participants said, yes, elements describe learning outcomes, great. But others said, um, offered slightly different interpretations that they break down the competency. Yep, that's okay. They are the skills, right? They are performance criteria. That's interesting. They are the required skills and knowledge. Again, quite interesting. Or they are the assessment requirements. Probably all of these are, are still uh, true of, of elements, but it was a little bit concerning that some people were saying elements are performance criteria. Performance criteria definitely articulate um, the essential outcome described in an element. So there's that very tight relationship between performance criteria and elements. But I, I, I was hearing at times some slightly concerning um, reflections on on what the, what, this, what the parts of a unit um, uh, amounted to and especially how they work together. Performance criteria, also, also quite interesting, their benchmarks and levels of performance, which, which does actually align nicely with the official definition of performance criteria, but that they also have these uh, aspects that they are assessment requirements, that they are assessment questions, that they are skills, that they are tasks, that they are roles. So again, um, there, there's nothing terribly wrong in any of these in any of these answers, but it does point to um, a certain diversity of understanding of this fundamental part of a unit of competency. Required skills and knowledge. I won't go through all these, but I will point out that. Um, three of the participants couldn't tell me what the required skills and knowledge were, or you know what what part they play in in a unit of competency. In those days, there was a range statement included in units of competency. Here, there was quite a lot of diversity in the responses of the participants. And um, again, of concern was that five out of the 30 participants couldn't tell me what a range statement was. Um, others said it was vague or confusing, couldn't say specifically what it was, but they knew it was there all right. When, when we spoke about how people approach reading and interpreting units of competency, there were quite a few different, there, there was quite a range of strategies. Um, so I've kind of, I've analysed those and articulated them here. Um, and th this saves us a little bit of time now in the presentation, but I, I've, I've kind of indicated that there are four basic processes. The first, is a holistic strategy where the, the trainer, assessor, teacher, etc., felt that they had to understand all the parts of a unit of competency before they could confidently say they understood it and could in, implement it. But there was a whole range of more limited strategies. The bulk of the participants described limited strategies. And by a limited strategy, I mean, they either just use the elements or they just use the elements and performance criteria, or they just use the performance criteria in isolation from other parts. Um, the, the limited strategies kind of make sense if you reflect back on some of the, 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 the responses people were giving where that they really weren't very clear about what this or that part of a unit of competency contributed. So it, it doesn't surprise me that limited strategies were the most commonly described approach. But um, from the perspective of what's described in the unit of competency for unpacking uh, training packages, limited strategies are a real concern because it means important information that is separated for various good reasons is not being pulled back together into a, 
a, a, a more rich, more um, a more effective kind of interpretation. Another couple of um, points here is that there was very limited confirmation of interpretation. So by that, I just mean people were not necessarily going back to units of competency. After a while, they, they, they would read them, work on their interpretation and say, OK, that's enough of that. I'll, I'll go and I'll start planning my learning, I'll design assessment, I'll teach and train. Um, and they would not go back. And further, and related to this, there was limited rechecking of interpretation. So if a person wasn't 100% sure about the interpretation of a unit of competency, they were not necessarily going back and checking, checking with colleagues, checking with um, RTO leadership um, networks. Uh, so th th there was a, a slightly troubling um, lack of going back, um, comparing notes, of comparing uh, interpretations, especially when many of the participants weren't confident in how they interpreted their, their, the units that they were involved in. There were different views about competencies. So there was, toward the end of the interviews, I, I switched over to you know, what, what's your high level kind of comments or views or perspective on competencies? What was interesting was the large number of participants who paradoxically thought that industry wasn't, wasn't terribly involved in the writing of the, the competencies. That, that, that just sounds crazy in a way, but um, people... Uh, uh, you know, re really sensible, highly skilled trainers were saying things like this. Look, there's got to be some industry people. I reckon there's got to be industry people in there that are writing these. But sometimes I can read and think, oh, that hasn't been written by an industry person. That was from an agricultural trainer. Uh, some, some, definitely not a majority, but there was, was a core of the participants who were extremely critical of, of competencies. This person, a business services trainer, said, I think they seem to be political documents written to satisfy too many masters. They don't seem to me to be written with a student or the teacher in mind, because I, as a conscientious and intelligent person, should be able to read through one and have it make sense. Perhaps not immediately, but on a second reading go, yeah, that's where this is going. I see what I need to do, what I need. They're written for auditing requirements, I think. So there, there, there were views like this. this. This person had never been asked their, their view on competencies. And so I, I, I think that through the research process, a lot of people were, were speaking articulating thoughts that they'd never had a chance to to sort of share or air. Um, so so this person was quite cranky about the, the, the how the how the system was working. And especially they felt because they 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 were a really bright person with um, good experience and good qualifications, um, that they felt a little bit um, inadequate uh, because the units weren't making immediate sense to them. There were definitely plenty of optimistic and positive views. So there was a view that competencies have improved. Some of the old timers I spoke to referred to earlier phases where the units weren't very good for various reasons and that things had definitely improved. The industry skills councils at the time were described as responsive when people approached them to say there was a problem, something was out of date, something wasn't clear. And there was great optimism at the time about the streamlining initiative, which was a new format for competencies that split the assessment requirements uh, from the main unit of competency document and, and reduced some of the information range statement came out as such. So, so there was plenty of optimism and, and, uh, and, and for good reason. Just summarising now um, these findings, 
Overall, we can say that training in interpretation of competencies is limited. The language of competencies can be challenging. People's understanding of competencies can be limited. Processes of interpretation could be limited. And as you can see from those last few slides, there, were, there was some ambiguity about uh, how people felt uh, about the competencies. So that's a summary of the findings. Um, what, what I've done in the year since is I've puzzled over this, this research. Um, when, when the research was submitted to NCBER, they, they in turn gave it to a panel of experts to consider before they published it. And I remember talking with some of the panelists about it. Uh, and I remember Bill and Clayton uh, was one of those panelists and, and she was quite alarmed uh, about this, but on the other hand, wasn't that surprised. So there was uh, a sense from the panelists that they thought maybe this was a situation that interpreting competencies isn't straightforward, that maybe we're not preparing people well enough, um, that maybe the PD is, um, is falling short to some extent. Now, I myself have been, uh, I, you know, I've researched all sorts of different things in the meantime, but I keep coming back to this study because I think it says something very, very important about VET. And it's described something that has not gone away. It describes something that goes, goes to the, the DNA of the system. Because remember, trainers, assessors, teachers, facilitators are that critical pivot in the, the logic of our system. And if, if there are any problems at all in terms of their work to interpret and implement competencies, then the whole system is in some sense vulnerable. Um, a, another another uh, reflection I have is that a lot of senior people um, who learnt about this research could almost not believe it. Uh, they 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 had assumed the the story that we tell ourselves about the system that this logic is 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 really solid. That if you get an expert in agriculture and you give them the units of competency that industry people have helped to formulate, those units of competency will be transparent. They will make perfect sense. You won't have to spend a lot of time unpacking them because you're an expert in the same area, right? Um, so something really interesting is going on there where an expert can still struggle with um, the way these things are written. Now, I have a little bit of time left and with Paul's indulgence, I'll take us on a little bit of a theoretical journey and I, I, I hope that's okay uh, by people. I've spent a lot of time going back, looking at completely different areas, way outside education to try and make sense of, of this research. One of the areas that I've looked at is interpretation, right? Because if you think, well, um, back to the details out of the key unit of competency about unpacking training packages. Interpretation was mentioned several times. And in the, in the latest incarnation of that unit, there's interpretation, 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 interpretation. So one of the things I did was look into interpretation theory and research. So there's a whole field of work on interpretation. And the, the word that they use to talk about that field is hermeneutics, hermeneutics. So um, a barbaric word for a very straightforward kind of concern, which is how do people interpret important documents? Now, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of an excursion into hermeneutics and, and hopefully uh, inspire you to think as well about um, about some of the, the, the really interesting challenges we have in a system where units of competency are fundamentally important to the integrity of the system and to what we're teaching and assessing every day. 
Hermeneutics itself, which is theory of interpretation, it developed in the context of deciphering ancient scriptures. So uh, anyone with an interest in religion based on an old, old book will be faced with the, with the problem of how do you interpret that scripture for a modern context? So a, 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 a scripture, something like the Bible or the Quran or any of the Vedic texts or any of the Buddhist texts, we're talking about very, very old documents that remain extremely important to contemporary people. So the, the theory of interpretation actually got its starting point in arguments about, well, how do we interpret, how do we find the true meaning of these ancient texts? Our problem in VET is nowhere near as extreme as that. However, there are parallels. Units of competency are especially important texts to us. So there, there's a parallel there in that units of competency aren't just another policy document. They're not just another, um, they're not a bit of information. They are telling us what we're about in Australian vet. So, so they are important documents. And the question arises, well, how do people interpret them? This area of hermeneutics was further developed in Germany as a, as a methodology for deciphering classical texts because they were digging up ancient Greek and Latin texts all over the place at that point. And a lot of those didn't make sense either. Uh, a text written in 500 BC, how do you interpret it in the 1800s? Closer to home, German philosophers in particular have taken hermeneutics and said, you know, this is, this is important for everything because humans interpret each other, they interpret themselves, they interpret books and texts, of course, but interpretation is a general um, part of human life. So that's what these German philosophers um, said in the 19th and 20th century. So, so it kind of grew in scope, hermeneutics. Now, I'm not taking all of that on board here, but just want to point out two key hermeneutic concepts. So these are concepts that have stood the test of many, many years of research and debate and argument on the part of people looking at ancient scriptures, uh, laws, you know, because um, the interpretation of laws or the constitution, again, very important document written in another time that has contemporary relevance. So just, just, just um, sort of uh, humour me here that units of competency, although they, 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 they aren't laws, you know, maybe they're a bit close to that. Uh, they're not scriptures, obviously, but they still documents that have a special importance in bed. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's what I take from hermeneutic um, theory is that we've got important documents and we want to know that people are interpreting them in a consistent way. So just going, I can see by the time uh, rather quickly uh, here, just two hermeneutic concepts. The first is what they call the autonomy of the text. This is saying that hermeneutic research discovers that as soon as a text, like a, a scripture or a law or a unit of competency, leaves the writer, and goes out into the world, it starts to take on a life of its own. That's what the autonomy of the text means. And I've tried to kind of illustrate it here. When we're, when we're conversing with people, if we don't understand something, we can always say, hey, Stephen, what do you mean? Or, hey, Paul, what do you mean? And we can kind of there and then on the spot clarify the meaning. When we talk about texts, like units of competency, the text has to carry that meaning out into the world of vet, and people need to read it without necessarily ever knowing the author, definitely without being able to converse with the author about what did you mean when you when you wrote that in the in the performance criteria. So in vet, like in other areas, texts go out into the world and take on a life of their own. 
and have to be picked up by different people in different settings and interpreted. So there's already a diversity of interpretations that is inevitable because texts are autonomous and we, we can't, like in a conversation, check back on a meaning. The other concept, oh yes, so, so th these are some yeah, implications and perhaps if you obtain this presentation later, you'll be able to, to look these things up. The other concept is a thing called the hermeneutic circle, which is the idea that reading a text like a unit of competency is actually a very complex thing where we, we have an initial guess at the meaning of it. We think at it, think about that guess. We check the guess against what we're reading. And that sort of sharpens or deepens what we guessed. And we might go from there to implementing something. Now, a couple of things about hermeneutic circles is that according to the theory, there's no definite end. You can always go back, in our case, to a unit of competency and find more in it than what you realised. Um, my, my own reading of competencies has always been like that. After some experience of teaching a unit of competency, I can go back and go, oh, wow, um, that wasn't so clear to me at the time, but on a, on a third or on a fifth or a tenth reading, something else comes to light. Um, so a hermeneutic circle is kind of central to, to uh, hermeneutic theory. It definitely applies to working with units of competency because people do make a guess and they do kind of confirm their guess. And at some time they have to exit the circle so that they can do something, prepare resources, teach, assess. But they can always go back and continue to deepen their understanding. So to me, those just those two concepts from hermeneutic theory, the autonomy of the text and the hermeneutic circle shed a lot of light on what I researched because the autonomy of the text tells us that units of competency have a life of their own and they are cut off pretty much forever from the people who wrote them. And secondly, the hermeneutic circle tells us that reading and interpreting, especially a complex text, doesn't end, but rather it, it, can, it, it only pauses while we do something practical with what we understand. I will leave it there. There's some references to work that I've done, including that original research. And if you do, get hold of this presentation, you'll have those references if you if you like. I'll hand back over to Paul. I'll, shall I stop sharing this, Paul? Oh, look, you could, you could leave it there or stop sharing. It doesn't really matter, Stephen, but uh, thank you so much for that presentation. And it's left me with uh, so many thoughts and reflections and moments of, uh, oh, yes, yes, I really, I've, I've, and you saw in, oh, you probably didn't see, but in the chat, that there was a lot of um, virtual head nodding. You could really see amongst the, the chatter that it was like, yes, I really, I, I've experienced this too, especially when you were sharing some of the comments yeah. from your research for, from the, the, the participants made. Um, and there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of commentary along the way, uh, not a great deal of actual questions, but if anyone does have any questions they'd like to ask, um, it looks like the chat's probably flying a little bit too quickly to keep up with, but do put it in the Q&A feature. Um, but just, Stephen, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll just share with you a few comments that I managed to pick up on from the chat as we went along. Yes. Um, in general, there, were a, there was a lot of commentary around uh, tensions between the, the interplay between compliance. So what I, I interpreted that as being like perhaps a provider, an RTO or trainer's desire to uh, not um, be penalised by the regulator um, at the same time as trying to then interpret the units and then deliver an experience for their students that made sense and was educationally sound. So there's a lot of that sort of comments. It was, it was a challenge in the tensions and interplay there. Um, Paul, can I just say to that that... Um... 
from the very start of training reform in Australia, the intention was that providers would take the units of competency as the very base of what they do in their, in their training and assessment and build on top of it, that they would make them richer, they would flesh them out. Um, there's a text uh, written in 1995 uh, on you know, basically addressed to Australian vet trainers how to use this new system. And they said that your role as trainers and assessors was to challenge and get at the meaning of units of competency. Now, um, that, that's many years ago, 1995. Only the other day, I was speaking to the CEO of one of the jobs and skills organisations who said, why don't providers add what they need to units of competency to make rich, interesting learning? Why do they think they have to stick with exactly what's written in units of competency? And that was quite a, that was quite a, 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 a moment of uh, insight that, of course, there's absolutely nothing in the system that says you can only teach what's in a unit of competency. Of course, imagined and real um, perceptions of what ASQA will do um, has a curbing effect on people's creativity, but also funding rules, uh, other kinds of pressures come onto the system that actually make it just a safer bet. Just teach what's in the units of competency, the rest can be taken care of in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, great point. And uh... Another, another thing that was interesting to me was, uh, it, it, and it probably confirms some, I suppose, some informal research or observations that we had here was when we were delivering the TAE, we found that when we actually taught the validation unit first, um, that it, because you mentioned in your presentation that one of your findings was that validation was a very powerful form of informal PD. And we actually found um, taking people through the experience of validation and, and role playing that experience created really great outcomes and then led in really well to then go off and plan and develop assessments, conduct assessments. They got to see what was happening behind the scenes. So that was really uh, interesting to see that in there. Yeah. Uh, there was some comments from Dr. Zen Parry um, that uh, I'm on this webinar because two folks had very different interpretations of competency for the same unit. Um, uh, Zen also says that uh, I know Dr. Hodge mentioned something around this earlier, but how many of the survey participants had actually completed the training unit they were delivering and would that help with these issues? Um, Zen's context is teacher training, doing internships or externships in the skills that they're delivering. Um, sure. Yeah, look, that, that's a really, really interesting uh, comment. Um, uh, to to just to my mind, I'm just a just a kind of a, um, an observer of the of the sector, but I, I would say it doesn't necessarily help to have that 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 kind of background, um, just because uh, every unit of competency is interpreted in a certain way. I, I, I would say that those concepts we we're looking at of autonomy of text in a hermeneutic circle they tell us that the diversity of interpretations is inevitable uh, and that for us the, the the question should be how can we embrace it how can we make it work for us um, so uh, look I, I do I do really appreciate that that observation uh, but I, I think that that uh, uh, what, what the research says and what the follow-up kind of analysis uh, indicates is that um, uh, we, we, we need to get comfortable with diversity of interpretations. Yep. I, I think so too. Great comment. Um, a couple of other points here. Uh, I'm sort of, I, I know there was a lot of chat. I mean, there's really a lot of uh, chatter in there and a lot of really great points. And, and we'd probably be here all day if I was to just, rattle off most of them, but um, just trying to sort of gather them up and, and get some common themes here. There was a comment um, 
that was made by David and, and sort of echoed by a lot of other people, David Watkins. Um, one of the problems with the system is we need to maintain relevant and up-to-date units of competency. They're often quickly outdated. Uh, what measures do the industry skills bodies take to keep units of competency up to date? Um, I, I suppose there's already a, a, a process in place and a number of reforms underway at the moment looking at that very issue. Um, but just wanted to underscore that because that came up a few times. Yes, and if I could just uh, jump in there, the mm. um, the current uh, VET qualification, as it's called, um, um, review process, uh, reform process, uh, is trying to get at that. They're, they're trying to arrive at a situation where there are fewer, more broadly defined units of competency um, and that providers are given licence um, uh, metaphorically to uh, to keep things up to date at the curriculum level rather or the resource and training, training and assessment as a strategy level rather than all of these things being written down in competencies that go quickly out of date. So there's, there's, there's today, now, there's lots of out of date material in units of competency. The system is so slow uh, at times in addressing that. Um, so so it's, a, it's a really difficult problem here. Um, so that, that review process um, uh, is very aware of this, um, having spoken to a few of the people on that, on that working group. Uh, it, it's, it's extremely difficult, though, to, uh, to, to undertake a reform that goes to the architecture of units of competency. So we, we're talking about something extremely difficult to work with. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we might wrap it up there because uh, we, we are yes. well over time. And I, I just want to say again, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Oh, a pleasure. And, and being a part of this community, it's just grown so much this year and it's just such a fantastic way to have capped off the end of the year and uh, getting us all thinking about how we interpret units of competency. There's probably a lot of people who are going to be um, taking this thought into their, their break and then into the new year as well. Uh, I know I certainly will as, as a TAE practitioner, you know, this, this really is um, front and centre and very, very important to me and my colleagues as well. So... Thank you again for your time, Stephen. It's been an absolute pleasure to share it with you. Um, lots of other people uh, asked about the, the slides and the recording if they missed that. Yes, absolutely. You get a copy of the slides. We'll distribute the recording. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that. So thank you again, Stephen. Much appreciated. Have a great break, everyone. And you too, Paul and Jasmine. Thank you. Bye-bye.